Some of the things that we write into IEPs for students who are learning in a face-to-face -face environment are sort of just inherent in an online environment. Um, so for instance, extended time on tests, um, that's super easy for us to accommodate online. I mean, it's literally one click to change the amount of time that's provided for a student. Um, you know, what students getting extra time on assignments in an asynchronous environment that wouldn't even need to be written into an IEP because they have all the time they need um, until that course end date arrives. They can work on things as they see fit. I'm Nikki Herda, and this is Bright, stories of hope and innovation in Michigan classrooms, a podcast where we celebrate our state's educators and explore the future of learning. This past year, many students and their families struggled with the transition to fully remote learning. This held particularly true for students with IEP and 504 plans, who, on top of learning in a new way, also had their own unique needs that had to be met in order for them to be successful. Although, of course, it's highly dependent on each student's personal situation, an asynchronous online environment can actually be liberating to some students with IEP and 504 plans. Why? Because by virtue of this model, students can move through their course content at their own speed and get individualized help from their instructor when they need it. In today's episode, I chat with Lisa Rohde, a special education and instructional support manager at Michigan Virtual, who helps me understand how an IEP or 504 plan might look different in a face-to-face -face versus online setting, as well as some of the pros and cons of online learning for students requiring accommodations. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for joining me today for this episode of Bright. Can you talk to me about what it is that drew you to education? I grew up in a really small community, um, a suburb right outside of Detroit. Um, everybody knew everyone, but even then it was small. I had some really amazing teachers and some opportunities. Um, but as I got older, I started to realize that education was truly the way that someone could change their life. Um, I know that sounds like really idealistic, but um, I wanted to be part of that for kids. Um, I know that a lot of kids don't get to choose the situations they grow up in. They don't get to choose what they're dealing with growing up. Um, but they do have the power to become something different than that. And I feel like the starting point of that is their education. Um, so even if they came to my classroom and only took away, you know, a, a feeling of being safe at school or a desire to read more, um, I was okay with that because I wanted to help kids, uh, you know, achieve those goals. Um, when I was teaching face-to-face, -face, I had an opportunity to work as a Michigan Virtual mentor. Um, that was my first introduction to Michigan Virtual, and I was like, wow, this company is amazing. They're doing really cool things. I really want to be a part of that. So I kept watching and watching until something that I was able to um, be a part of became available. Um, and the kind of the rest was history there. Um, but, you know, having a chance to really research and build our special education program at Michigan Virtual um, from scratch, so before this, that there was really nothing concrete, um, was a really cool experience. And um, I had a chance to put into practice a lot of the things that I had been learning as a face-to-face -face teacher and in, you know, studying in my master's degree and all of those kind of things to um, really put together some supports for students taking courses through Michigan Virtual. And I just love working with teachers and helping to support the teachers. So this role was really fantastic for me. What about uh, special education? Like, how did you get your foot in the door there? And like, what were you seeing in, you know, in your classroom or in the world that, you know, made you really want to make a difference in this area? As a, a general ed teacher, I was seeing more and more students come into my classroom um, in an inclusion model where, you know, they were coming in and they were part of the general education classroom. And I started to think like, wow, what, um, what could I do for them that would really enhance their experience, but also provide them the support that they needed to be successful while keeping them with their classmates? Um, and online education really does that, um, lets them take a class at their own pace, um, lets them, you know, work through the material in a way that makes sense for them, but allows them to stay with their classmates. And I just think that's really important for students who may feel like they're being singled out sometimes or that their experience is different than everyone else's. 
Um, that does kind of lead into my next question. So um, when we talk about special education students, it does seem like there's a broad range of students that we're talking about. So how do you define that? Or like, how do you describe what that means and is? At Michigan Virtual, what we're talking about is students who have special academic needs. So those students who are working under an IEP or a 504 plan that have accommodations that are required to help support their learning to be successful in the online class, in the classroom. Um, that's kind of how we define it. Um, and I think it, part of that is also, um, you know, the students who need support from personnel locally to be successful as well. That's great. Thank you. Um, just in case somebody doesn't know who's listening, could you describe what an IEP and a 504 is and what the goal is behind these sorts of documents? Sure. An IEP is an individualized education program. Um, and a 504 is a document that supports students who may not have a learning challenge, but may have another kind of challenge that impacts their learning. Um, and accommodations are written into those plans to support student learning, to kind of level the playing field for students um, so that they are, you know, on par with other students that they're their peers. So this past year in particular, I've heard many reports and news stories about the challenges that families with special education students faced when it came to 100% uh, virtual learning. And I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about, you know, your perspective on this and what the unique challenges faced by these uh, student populations and these families was this year. Yeah, so one of the biggest challenges I think we saw this year was that IEP and 504 plans were really written to be executed in a face-to-face -face environment. So as kids started to work more and more online, it became very challenging to accommodate them using the accommodations that were written for what they would be doing face-to-face. -face. Um, I think as we move forward, that's going to be something that special education teachers and, you know, schools start to really consider when they're writing goals and accommodations for students is what kind of learning environment are students going to be in. But it was really challenging this year to try to match up what a student was doing online with what obligations we had to fulfill in terms of accommodations that were written for a totally different environment. So that really caused, um, you know, some challenges in terms of making sure students were getting everything that they needed to be successful. Um, another challenge that really came up was um, lots of students were very used to, um, I guess, like side by side support when they were working. They're used to being in a resource room or having a teacher support while they completed their classwork. And a lot of online work is asynchronous. So it was really difficult for them to get used to working in that new fashion. Um, students who receive services like PT or OT, um, that was really hard sometimes to do online because, um, you know, it's very difficult to help someone, you know, bend a knee or hold a pencil when you're not there to really help them do that. Um, so, you know, lots of times parents were kind of left to pick up the pieces here. And, you know, as this becomes less and less of an emergency situation and more of a situation that students are choosing to work online, this is something that we can probably, you know, decide to kind of clean up for students and, and think about ways that we can write IEPs that support online learning a little bit better. Maybe you could just give us like a couple examples of how it might look different, like concrete examples of how it might look different in a face-to-face -face learning environment and an online learning environment and advice you might give to someone who's designing an IEP or a 504 for an online student specifically. Sure. So thinking about um, the online learning environment, some of the things that we write into IEPs for students who are learning in a face-to-face -face environment are sort of just inherent in an online environment. Um, so for instance, extended time on tests. Um, that's super easy for us to accommodate online. I mean, it's literally one click to change the amount of time that's provided for a student. Um, you know, what students getting extra time on assignments in an asynchronous environment that wouldn't even need to be written into an IEP because they have all the time they need um, until that course end date arrives. They can work on things as they see fit. Um, we see things about reading 
tests and quizzes to students, we actually have a tool in our course, our courses that um, will read text to students from the screen. So a lot of the things that we plan for students in a face-to-face -face environment are just met by the the way that online learning works in a lot of cases. Um, and that's really important to think about because, hey, it's really cutting down the teacher who's writing the IEP's time spent, you know, writing these things and trying to implement them and sharing them out with all the various staff that's going to interact with that student. Um, but also, you know, for the student, it's a much uh, smaller list of, of things that they will need. So they're going to find themselves, you know, being able to do so much more without the restriction of um, having to worry about asking for all of these things because they're just there for them already. I've heard some interesting arguments that every student should have an IEP or an individualized education plan. What do you think about this? I think that actually that's a, a brilliant idea um, because education should be very individualized and be focused on what a student's interests are and what their overall goals are in terms of careers or future education. And I think it would be really, really exciting for a student to sit down with someone and map out what, where they want to be at the end of their high school career or, you know, moving into post-secondary education. I, I think that would be something that lots of students don't really get to experience and don't really have time to intentionally plan out where they want to go and what they want to do. So that might be a great experience for students. I'm Nikki Herta, and you're listening to Bright, a podcast that's made possible by Michigan Virtual, a nonprofit organization that's leading and collaborating to build learning environments for tomorrow. Today, I'm chatting with Lisa Rohde, a Special Education and Instructional Support Manager at Michigan Virtual. Up next, we talk about which students tend to thrive in online environments, Lisa's favorite teacher, and her vision for student learning. I'm wondering if you could give us, um, it doesn't have to be a real student, it could be a hypothetical, obviously you don't have to use their names, um, but just an example of like what this could look like in action. So like, you know, an, an example of a student who could use uh, virtual learning and like kind of have this, have this in its ideal form? You know, what would it look like? Well, um, an example might be, a, we have uh, several students who are taking courses with Michigan Virtual full-time that are, um, they have social anxieties. Um, so being able to kind of eliminate the need to interact live with their classmates or with their teachers can really, um, help ease that a little bit. Um, so while they're still engaging in coursework, they're still engaging with their instructor. They're just doing it in a different, more comfortable for them way. Many students obviously struggled this year with 100% virtual learning, but do you think that there are some students that didn't realize that it was actually really good for them and came away from it, like realizing that, you know, the online environment may be conducive towards, you know, their unique situation? I think a lot of students are going to leave this year thinking about like how great online learning was and want to keep doing it beyond this year because they enjoyed it. They liked the learning style. Um, they liked the way it supported some of their needs. Um, I think the biggest thing for all students is just the way that it's set up to work at your own pace. When you're taking a, a class face to face, you're moving through the class as the teacher is moving you through the class. Um, you know, in an online, in an asynchronous online case anyway, um, you're moving at your own pace and the teacher is supporting that pace as, you know, you move through the class. So it's a little bit different in, you know, people taking the time to really, you know, uh, study topics that they're struggling with or to get support on topics they're struggling with. Um, they're able to slow down and really digest information or ask for help in a different way. Um, and every day when they come to class, it's tailored to their needs and, you know, their desires and their goals instead of, you know, everyone moving along in like one giant mass group. So you work with a lot of online instructors. Mm-hmm. And I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about like, what are the qualities that you see in these online instructors that like impress you most and just make you excited? Like, what are the things that you love to celebrate about uh, what some of them are doing? Our online teaching staff here um, really 
is just amazing. Like I can't even begin to describe to you the amount of work that these teachers put into making sure that all of their students have an awesome experience in their class. I mean, I see teachers really going above and beyond to, you know, provide supplemental materials that they think students are going to be interested in or enhance what they're learning in the class. I see them reaching out to kids via Zoom or on the phone to, you know, go over things or just kind of check in on how they're doing or, you know, I, I sat in on a meeting not too long ago with a teacher going over um, Spanish pronunciation with a student who was trying to take a class like for credit forward purposes. Um, and just, you know, they, they really, really, really care about their students. And I think that a lot of times people think that online learning has less of a relationship component, but it really doesn't because you no, get to know students without ever seeing them, sometimes without ever hearing their voices. So you really learn about them through what they share with you, through their coursework, through their messages. Um, and you get to really, you know, get to know students on a different level because there are no preconceived notions. There is no, no one in the teacher's lounge letting you know that, oh my gosh, you have so-and-so in your class. That doesn't happen. Um, you know, and I just really, really admire the amount of, you know, tenacity and, and perseverance that our, our teachers show because all of them, every single one of them was dealing with emergency teaching um, at their face-to-face -face job if they're a part-time instructor or, you know, just changes overall in the way kids are learning or the type of students they were experiencing if they're a full-time instructor here. So all of them had other crazy business going on in their lives, but we're still really, really, really dedicated to making sure that students had a great experience and that they were getting what they needed from their classes and were able to move on successfully. All right, we're doing a slight shift here. So uh, can you tell me about your favorite teacher and why they were your favorite? Yes. So my favorite teacher um, is Paul Shemansky. Um, he was a math teacher um, for me at East Detroit High School back when I was uh, a student. And he is now an administrator. But at the time, math was and still is not really not my jam. Um, I was not a math student by any means. But um, even though the subject was very difficult to me, I really enjoyed Mr. Shemansky's class because he helped me to see the kind of teacher that I wanted to be as I moved forward. Um, he very much treated us like we were part of the learning process and would ask us to contribute to, you know, what we wanted to do in class and how we needed to learn and, and really didn't have that they're just kids mentality. Like he really saw us for being people with ideas. And, you know, I really also appreciated the humor in his teaching, which to me is very important. Like I like to laugh and I respect people that can make me laugh. So um, he kept very high standards for us, but also made the class very fun. Um, he was just a real person and showed us himself and showed us, you know, that we could ask questions, but really overall thinking back on it as an adult, um, really what he was teaching me was that education is about relationships just as much as that it's about content. And I hope he, you know, thinks about those students that he had in, in his Algebra 2 classes all those years ago and thinks about, you know, the impact that he may have had on our lives. That's so cool. Thank you. Let's talk about your vision for student learning. So I know that this is a big question and I don't expect it to be exhaustive. However, the way I break it down is if it were up to you, Lisa, what would you want to see for every single student? Um, I would envision students leaving high school with not only the content knowledge they need, but also preparation for their future careers and or higher education. Um, I would like all students to have access to technology and devices um, equitably. Um, I think that's really important that everyone would have the same access to online courses, to internet, to devices. Um, I would like to see every student have access to quality online learning that's developed by people who really care about online learning and want to see students be successful in that aspect. 
Um, and I would like everyone to have the ability to choose the kind of education that works for them. If you like face-to-face traditional classroom, great. If you want to continue to work online, great. If you want to do some mix of the two, that's fantastic. And I would like to see kids really have more choice in how they're learning. Um, and I would love to see teachers have adequate preparation and rest time so they come back to their classrooms feeling rejuvenated. I feel like they, that really pays a part in student learning when their teachers get a break and also are trained appropriately for what they're being asked to do. Um, so I hope that all of our teachers are getting some, some rest and relaxation time to be able to be at the top of their game for their students. Awesome. Thank you. Do you have any words of advice or encouragement that you'd like to just offer to our educators right now? Oh my gosh. Um, As always, so much is expected of our teachers and things are always changing. Um, But you're doing a fantastic job, right? I want teachers to know that they're doing a great job. Um, Kids are learning. Kids are feeling like your classroom is a safe place. It's a good place to learn. Um, And I think keep doing the best that you are able to do, your colleagues, your friends. And I think everyone that has knows someone that's going to school or has a child in school is proud of the work that you're doing and is thankful for the work that you're doing, keeping students learning during a difficult time. And I think that you're all very amazing. Online learning comes with its challenges and its benefits, but some students with the IEP and 504 plans report having a deep appreciation for the ability to move through learning materials at their own pace. Lisa offers a unique perspective on why this is, in part thanks to her wealth of experience as the pioneer of special education supports at Michigan Virtual. Without a doubt, it's challenging work to design learning environments, whether face-to-face or online, that can be easily accommodated to meet each student's unique needs and circumstances. But with leaders like Lisa forging our path forward, if there's one thing we're certain of, it's that the future is bright. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Bright, stories of hope and innovation in Michigan classrooms. This podcast is produced by Kirby Gaylord, is hosted by me, Nikki Herta, and is shaped by many of our passionate and talented colleagues. Big thanks to Krista Green, Emily Cecilia, Ann Kraft, and Brandon Batista for their contributions to this episode. The Bright podcast is made possible by Michigan Virtual, a nonprofit organization that's leading and collaborating to build learning environments for tomorrow. Education is changing faster than ever. Discover new models and resources to move learning forward at your school at michiganvirtual.org.